also an increase in erosion rates. But I think this picture kind of speaks for itself. I mean, the, the rivers are getting closer and closer to people's homes, and the, and the homes are, are definitely going into the water. <laughs> people are also concerned about how um, the soil is changing and how that's changing the vegetation along with the, with the erosion. It's also a concern of the increase in industry activity. Now here we see a map of the Bering Straits. Uh, a lot of conversation has been taking place about the expected increase in shipping throughout this area. The surrounding villages around that area are really concerned about the lack of involvement that they've had in deciding what, what the best actions are going to be to prepare for an increase in shipping, or the fact that there already is an increase in shipping. Their concerns are for their own hunter's safety, for the animals, that it's going to, going to change the distribution of the animals, that they're concerned about what pollutants might be added to the water and how that's going to affect the land. It, one elder even said to me, this was really, this is very sad, she said, why can't they understand that we're human beings and that we have a life here? And they feel very disconnected from any of the decisions that are being made about this or information that's being shared with them. Now, we're just, not just looking at drivers of food insecurity. We're also looking at drivers of food security, such as sharing systems. We see these systems within youth programs, preservation of language, environmental health, etc. For example, it is common practice for the first catch of a season to be given entirely to an elder. Feast or potlatches occur often throughout the winter and allow for food to be shared during a time that uh, food becomes scarce. Communities share and trade foods with, ex with each other. For example, this young man is being taught how to cut up an oak brook in a village that's found up the river. The oak brook was cut at a coastal village and sent to some friends that are up river. But sharing of this food isn't the only thing occurring within this picture. The young men standing around are also being taught about Oak Brook and what that has to do with the food that they depend on. They're being taught how to respect the animal. People also tend to share from very far villages from each other. So there's a village, um, the village right over there, Point Hope tend to send beluga all the way to Amatuba Cass right down here. When Amatuba Cass isn't able to gain enough caribou for that season and vice versa. Next we need to identify methods within TK of monitoring and assessing the drivers. This is not an easy task because it has to do with translating languages, which is a bit difficult but a necessary, a necessary step. This might result in multiple different suggestive research actions, such as a need to identify cultural keystone species as well as ecological keystone species. The need to determine if monitoring methodologies found with T within TK may be more useful, or science may be, or both, depending on what the questions are. There definitely are some differences between TK and science. I'm sure everybody is familiar with that. But I want to share with you with what one of my elders described it. She said, how the Arctic residents see, for example, Pacific walrus in their natural way, in different seasons and conditions. And when we know their environments are healthy, so will the Arctic indigenous residents will be too. Western science observations are often views of Arctic in a detached, distant, periodic way, whereas sea ice is an everyday aspect of our lives, and it plays an important aspect of our life. Knowing ice is a survival skill here. This can be broken down in many different topics, so further down south from where this elder is, they depend a lot on salmon. And when they collect the salmon, it's often the men that collect the salmon and then the women that cut up the salmon. They look at various different things to determine the health of the salmon. They look at the other animals that are in the water at the same time. They look at the vegetation that's along the, the river to know whether it's a good time to catch salmon or not. They, when they pick up the salmon, they're looking at the texture of the meat, the smell of the meat, the color of the meat. 
They're looking at the scales. And all of this put together will give them an idea of whether it's, a, whether it's a good salmon to eat or not, but also whether they need to go catch more or they need to leave that animal alone for a little bit. It gives them some type of indication of population, I guess, as well. This is very different. Uh, I, I was in school to learn about fish, and they taught me something very different than these people taught me. You know, they taught me to look in a microscope and to look at large data sheets of numbers. It was a very different way of looking at fish than, than what is taught along the Yukon River. So it's really important to identify those methodologies in order for us to create this assessment tool. Now in conjunction to creating this tool, we hope to set a precedent in how this type of research is conducted. So some key aspects of the methodology that we have employed allows for flexibility in order to incorporate new concepts and ideas gathered from Inuit. I will quickly go over just a few of these. Now to start with, the project is grounded in the community. That's because our board determined that food security is a number one priority. Our board is a group of Inuit leaders from the four regions that we represent. These are the four regions we represent within Alaska. So to start the project, there's 95 villages throughout these four regions. We contacted all the tribal councils and elders groups because that's who we recognize to be the leading authority within these villages. We told them about the project, asked them if they wanted the project to take place, asked them for feedback about the project. From there, we established an advisory committee with representatives from each of these regions. The community is made up of traditional knowledge holders and one anthropologist. It's really important that they're all traditional knowledge holders because they're going to do the final review of this product. And we need to make a statement that traditional knowledge is validated by traditional knowledge holders, not by scientists. There's also a youth on each, on, or a youth from each one of these regions on the advisory committee. So then we go to 16 of the villages. So I spent the last winter going to 16 of these villages, and we do, uh, we're very adaptive in the way that we communicate in the village. But customarily, we have a community meeting so everybody can hear about the project and have a chance to voice any ideas that they have that should adjust it. We then go to the school and speak with the school, speak with the classes. And most of these villages have a very small school. So like in one village, I went and spoke to the entire school and it was 18 students. After that, we meet with experts. Now, the experts are identified by the elders council and the tribal council. These experts then we engage in a semi-directed interview process that allows the experts to guide the conversation without being affected by my biases. Okay. <laughs> now, after everything's finished, the advisory committee is going to do the peer review and the ICC board will, will uh, determine if it's good to go on. And after we've done that part, we'll return to all 16 villages to talk about the project, but to also adjust it specifically to those villages. Now that won't be done for all 95 villages, of course, but for those particular 16 villages, because they're the authors of the project. And I guess that's another key aspect of it, that every expert that's spoken to is listed as a contributing author of the project. So this project is, uh, well, or when we, fi when we finish the framework, it's going to be shared with all Native organizations, state and federal agencies, industry, and maybe most importantly, the Arctic Council, because we want the Arctic Council to use this assessment to do, the, to do those practices throughout the entire Arctic. Now, this project is ongoing and not scheduled to be finished until around November 2014. But what we've learned so far is that accumul accumulation of stressors is causing food insecurity, that food security is synonymous with environmental health from an Inuit perspective, that decisions need to be based on both traditional knowledge and science, and that the means that research 
and that means that research needs to be based on both traditional knowledge and science. With greater involvement in looking at the Arctic through a food security lens, adaptive management, a holistic understanding of the Arctic systems and preservation of the entire ecosystem. Ultimately, the framework will be a tool to enhance the ability of the Inuit community to adapt to a changing environment, as well as provide an understanding for elected leaders what the drivers of food security and insecurity are. So with that, I'll conclude. Koyana Teku. Maybe you have questions. Yeah. Um, as you say, you visit 16 out of the 95 communities. How do you, how are the decisions made about who you can actually engage with out of all of those groups? So there were three criteria for making that decision. Um, I gave some input into some of that decisions, but most of it came down to the advisory committee. It was based off of the ecotype that they're in, and that's where my influence on the decision came in because it was pretty important that we cover as many different ecotypes as possible because those four regions have a lot of varying environments. The second part was how much traditional um, engagement did they still, how much do they still rely on hunting and gathering? And the third part was how interested were they in the project? Did they really want to be part of it? Now unfortunately there was a huge more amount that wanted to be part of it that we weren't able to go to. So the part that I did forget to say is that we're hoping to have a workshop in each region that would allow for all of the other villages to come to that workshop and it will just be one day where we'll suss out every all the information we've gained so far and people will give input into what's been missing or if things have been misinterpreted. Mm. Yeah, the sharing systems are incredibly important. Um, they're part of the culture and part of the tradition that elders are taken care of, that elders are given food. Um, that when there's somebody, you know, right now one of the drivers of insecurity is the cost of fuel and not being able to have a working uh, vehicle to go and, and go hunting uh, or fishing or gathering. And so sharing systems are extending into that way as well, that maybe uh, for a group of hunters, they will get together and put money in for the fuel and, and send out a couple of hunters to bring food back for everybody. At the potlatches too, the potlatches are a huge tradition where neighboring villages will get together and everybody brings food and there's big dance and lots of food. And this is traditionally done at one of the lowest times of the year. It not only makes sure that people have food to eat, but it also has um, a lot of cultural sharing because this could be, uh, you know, your energy can get down at this time. It's dark in Alaska in the winter <laughs> and it's very cold. So it's, it, it serves many purposes. Thanks, thanks Caroline. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the framework uh, may look like when you're finished. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, so as I said, the framework needs to first have the definition and um, of what food security is. It will list all of the drivers that people have said. There's an issue that not, not every village is the same, of course, and not every region is the same. So people have individual concerns, but they fall under an overarching concern. So that might be access to food, and accessibility could be interrupted by numerous things. Lack of knowledge being transferred, regulations, change in distribution, all kinds of things. Throughout those 16 villages, they've all shared those concerns with me that fall under that guide. So then the framework would then say, how do we monitor and measure that? And we need to identify ways both within traditional knowledge and science to do that. I suspect that in the end it will have a lot to do with a large food web dynamic assessment that incorporates culture as part of it. 
Okay, one more question. Um, it's come up a few times throughout the conference um, about traditional knowledge and protecting the intellectual, cultural property rights of, of that knowledge. So how, do, how does your program do that? But I guess in particular relation to, I'm not sure how it's funded, but say like in Australian context, say the, the government funds a lot of these projects, therefore there's some automatic right that the government has access to all of that knowledge as well? We do not take any funding that says they have a right to any information that we generate. We actually, as ICC, we do not take any funding from anybody that thinks they're going to tell us what to do or what our priorities should be. And so it's really set firmly by my leadership that we don't, we're very happy to take money from industry or an environmentalist, it's all fine, we don't really care. We all have our own objectives. We just don't want them telling us what our objectives need to be. Okay, if everyone could thank Carolina for her presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.